Today, uh, in our reading and what I'm going to talk about, I'd love us to look at this whole idea of leadership. And this is relevant for you, for every single one of us. Why do I say that? In 2 Corinthians 5.20, St. Paul says, the minute you choose to follow Christ, you become an ambassador for him. That means you become a person of influence or potential influence. Others will look to you whether you like it or not. And leadership is influence. Even the most um, uh, sort of quiet or shy of one's others, introverted, will, will influence up to 10,000 people directly or indirectly in our lifetime. That means this message is relevant for you. And if you came to our leadership conference in June, you would have heard Pastor Mike Todd talk about Saul, Saul, the first king of Israel. And he, he spoke about how Saul eventually disqualifies himself from leadership because of his disobedience and the way he messes up. And he encouraged us not to do the same, not to uh, uh, disqualify ourselves from being a leader and not to repeat the, the mistakes of Saul. But this got me asking a question. Why did God choose Saul to be king in the first place? And our reading today is 1 Samuel chapter 10 in the Old Testament. And here we'll see how and why God chose Saul. And in this passage, we'll see some fantastic leadership lessons that are still relevant today. You see, we can learn from Saul's early life before he messes up, as well as learning from him his mistakes. So um, we're going to look at this passage. And the background is Saul has a father called Kish. And Kish has lost his donkeys. I'm sure you've had that challenge many a time in your own life. It's like, you know, you turn up, <laughs> turn up to Jaya Grosso and you're thinking, where did I put those donkeys? Um, and so Kish sends his son Saul plus one servant to go and look for the donkeys. And they travel around trying to find them, but to no avail. It looks like a wild goose chase or, uh, forgive the pun, a wild donkey chase. And um, on their travels, they come to a town where a prophet called Samuel lives. And the servant has a good idea. He goes, hey, boss, why don't we ask the prophet where the donkeys are? Good idea, right? I mean, if you've lost your donkeys, you want to ask a prophet. So Saul goes uh, to approach Samuel, and it's at this point that God says to Samuel the prophet, ah, this is the guy to anoint as the nation's king. Okay, so that's the background. We're gonna pick it up, 1 Samuel chapter 10, beginning at verse one. Then Samuel, that's the prophet, took a flask of olive oil and poured it on Saul's head and kissed him. Now, this is a weird greeting. I'm sure people don't normally greet you this way. Oh, hi, Miles. <laughs> <laughs> it's, not, it's not some strange greeting, but he's anointing him. To anoint means for God to set apart and to empower you for a particular purpose kissed him, saying, has not the Lord anointed you ruler over his inheritance, uh, over all the people? And then we're going to jump to verse 6. The spirit of the Lord will come powerfully upon you, and you will prophesy with them, with the other prophets, and you will be changed into a different person. This is what Samuel said to Saul. Once these signs are fulfilled, do whatever your hand finds to do. For God is with you. So what happens then is uh, Saul turns to leave and there's a band of prophets coming along and he starts to prophesy with them when the Spirit comes on him. We read this. As Saul turned to leave Samuel, God changed Saul, Saul's heart and all these signs were fulfilled that day. When he and his servant arrived at Gibeah, a procession of prophets met him. The Spirit of God came powerfully upon him and he joined in their prophesying. I don't know why I'm doing that. I guess that's <laughs> But you, you, know, you get the point. When all those who had formerly known him saw him prophesying with the prophets, they asked each other, what is this? 
that has happened to the son of Kish? Is Saul also among the prophets? A man who lived there answered, and who is their father? So it became a saying, is Saul also among the prophets? After Saul stopped prophesying, he went to the high place. Now, uh, Saul's uncle asked him and his servant, where have you been? Looking for the donkeys, he said. But when he, we saw they were not to be found, we went to Samuel. Saul's uncle said, well, tell me what Samuel said to you. Saul replied, he assured us that the donkeys had been found, but he did not tell his uncle what Samuel had said about the kingship. Okay, now we're just going to jump on in the story. What's happened now is eventually Samuel gathers all the people and he presents to them Saul as their king. Samuel explained to the people the rights and duties of kingship. He wrote them down on a scroll and deposited it before the Lord. Then Samuel dismissed the people to go to their own homes. Saul also went to his home in Gibeah, accompanied by valiant men whose hearts God had touched. But some scoundrels said, how can this fellow save us? They despised him and brought him no gifts. But Saul kept silent. Amen. From this passage, we can find seven hallmarks of great leadership that are still relevant for us today. What are they? Number one, great leaders understand and accept their calling and their anointing. Verse one. Then Samuel took a flask of olive oil and poured it on Saul's head and kissed him, saying, has not the Lord anointed you leader over his inheritance? Saul was anointed for a specific purpose as leader over the nation. Jesus also understood and accepted his purpose. And we know this because he declared the fulfillment of Isaiah 61 as he read from the scroll in the synagogue in Luke chapter 4. Jesus reads out, The Spirit of the Sovereign Lord is upon me, for he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor, to bind up the brokenhearted, and so on and so forth. Both Saul and Jesus were anointed for something specific, and you are anointed for something. We must be who God calls us to be, not pretend to be someone else. So your anointing is most probably to be a faithful son or daughter to your parents. Your anointing might be to be a spouse or a parent yourself one day. Your anointing might be to be a teacher or a a business person or a hairdresser or a a kind neighbor or all of the above. You are called for something. And remember, it's not about fulfilling your potential, but about obeying God's plan for your life. And just as individuals, we we can be anointed, so can groups, uh, families can be anointed, communities and churches. This church, HTBB, is anointed to be the alpha hub for Asia Pacific. We serve thousands of churches across the region, training them how to use the tool of the alpha course. And you might be sitting here going, yeah, but Miles, I don't know what I'm called for or what I'm anointed for. Don't worry. You're not going to miss out. The Lord will bring it about in good time. You don't have to chase your anointing. It will come to you. Saul did not chase his anointing. Actually, he was chasing donkeys. (laughs) And it wasn't even his idea to approach the prophet Samuel. It was his servant's idea. And likewise, God's anointing will seek you out, as it were. God's anointing for his plan for you will come upon you in good time, but accept it when it comes. 
Secondly, great leaders have healthy hearts. Verse 6. The Spirit of the Lord will come upon you in power and you will prophesy with them and you will be changed into a different person. And then verse 9 says, As Saul turned to leave Samuel, God changed Saul's heart. Saul became a different person with a different heart. Now, I don't think this means he had a literal heart transplant, but rather the inner person, his spirit, was transformed. And what changes our heart? Verse 6, the spirit of the Lord will come upon you. The spirit of God is now freely poured out on all of us. And the spirit changes our hearts of stone, our hard hearts, into hearts of flesh. In other words, our hearts are softened as God pours his love into our hearts by the spirit. Last weekend was the um, Alpha Weekend Away in Malacca for those guests on the current Alpha course. And once again, we saw God pouring out his spirit into people's hearts, touching them, softening their hearts. And keeping a soft, pure heart is the key to good leadership. You know, King Solomon, the wisest man on the planet, wrote over 3,000 proverbs. And he wrote this in Proverbs 4, verse 23. He says, above all else, guard your heart, for it is the wellspring of life. It's from which all life and wisdom comes. And the heart is the key to personal transformation. My father used to be in the army, and only very recently I discovered that although he was not a churchgoer, whilst he was in the army, he signed up for confirmation. Now, confirmation is something the Anglican Church does. If you've been previously baptized, then you're allowed to go for confirmation, where you reaffirm your baptismal vows, and you're prayed for to be filled with the Holy Spirit. So I thought this was rather odd that my father, not a churchgoer, decided in the army to go for confirmation. I said, Dad, why did you do that? He goes, well, the army chaplain told us that the confirmation preparation classes were being held next to a ski resort in Switzerland. <laughs> and as the army was paying, I signed up. I think he spent most of the week on the slopes not in the confirmation class, but then he got confirmed. And um, when he got back, he told his mum and dad, oh, mum, dad, I got confirmed. And they said, but you can't be confirmed. We never baptised you. <laughs> uh, I just assumed you had. As a, so he put on the form, yes, I'm baptised, but he wasn't. But it was only years later when he was dating my mother and they were, they were thinking about getting married and they wanted to be married in, in a church. And if you get married in the Church of England, you've got to be baptized. He thought, I, I better sort this out. So on his own, he went along to the local church and he said to the pastor there, will you baptize me? And he said, yeah, okay, come back this time and, and I'll baptize you. So he baptized him and it was after that. Yeah, my father had always been a really good man. But it was after that that my mum said genuine faith kind of was planted in him and he began to change. And I said to her, this was about two weeks ago, I said, mum, how did dad ch change? And she said he became much softer on the inside. And good leadership is about having a soft heart. You know, the world is tough. I don't need to tell you that. Being a leader is tough, but to lead with a soft heart is the key to doing it well. Number three, great leaders know what the occasion demands. In verse seven, it says uh, this. Once these signs are fulfilled, do whatever your hands find to do, or as other uh, translations say, once these signs are fulfilled, do as the occasion demands, for God is with you. Much of leadership is routine. 
It involves doing the same. But we must be flexible enough to respond to the occasion and to lead differently or to give something specific focus as the situation demands. I remember once I was um, picking my children from school and as I was pulling out of the car park space, a child, a very small child, ran in front of the car. And to avoid hitting the child, I had to swerve and I drove into a pillar. Now, that was the right thing to do. The situation demanded it. But I can tell you, every time I drive, I do not normally aim for a pillar. <laughs> but we have to know what to do in particular circumstances. In crises, we can't lead with rigidity. We have to be open to the Holy Spirit to guide us and give us wisdom from the Lord to know what to do. In 1 Chronicles 12, 32, it says of the men of Issachar that they understood the times and knew what to do. Do you understand the times and are you open to the Spirit showing you what to do? Uh, just a few weeks ago, um, I went to Nairobi in Kenya to help launch the Alpha Hub for East Africa. And we did an, uh, an Alpha conference, uh, training people there, other churches how to use Alpha. And um, a church in Nairobi called Nairobi Chapel had sent a team to be trained because they're gonna start their first Alpha next month, this September. And one of their team members is a guy called William. Could we show the photo of William, please? This is Whitney and William. And he's a great guy, very smart. He's actually not Kenyan, he's from Liberia. And uh, the Lord had previously placed on his heart a vision to return to Liberia and to plant a church. And um, he'd shared that with some of his friends back home and they're planning to plant a church February next year. He just had one slight problem. He didn't know how to do it. But when I gave my uh, talk, my session at the conference, I shared our story, our story of HTBB, how we began from an Alpha course in somebody's home, and how Alpha has helped grow and bring life to this community. And it was after that he came up to me and he goes, do you know what? He said, as you were speaking, I felt the Holy Spirit reveal something to me. I now know what to do. We're gonna use Alpha as our church planting tool when we begin February next year. The Spirit can show you what to do. Maybe you're facing a situation right now where you feel, oh, I just don't know what to do. The Spirit today can reveal you and show you what the occasion demands. Number four, great leaders stand firm when opposed. Verse 10 says this. When they arrived at Gibeah, a procession of prophets met him. The Spirit of God came upon him in power, that's Saul, and he joined in their prophesying. When all those who had formerly known him saw him prophesying with the prophets, they asked each other, what is this that has happened to the son of Kish? Is Saul also among the prophets? There was cynicism about Saul's anointing. Those who knew him questioned his right to prophesy and they tried to limit him to who he used to be. Do you know, as you step out in leadership, into your calling, into your anointing, you will face some opposition or intimidation. Those who want you to stay as you once were, to try and box you. And they may even try to make you feel small to keep you there. And if this happens, refuse to shrink back. Greater growth and momentum will result. This is someone else that I met in Nairobi, a, a remarkable woman called Judy. The Lord gave her a vision to plant a church to reach young people, teenagers, who live in Nairobi's biggest slum 
It's an absolutely appalling place. And of course, when she shared that vision with others, many people said to her, don't do it, Judy, it's too dangerous. Or, you're, you're not equipped or trained to do that. It's not going to work. Why are they going to be interested? It's a crazy idea. But Judy refused to shrink back. So she began by running football tournaments on the slum for the teenagers. And these football games attracted about 250 teenagers each week. And she's now transitioned them into small groups. And again, at the conference, she goes, now I know what to do. We're going to run alpha in those small groups with the teenagers. She refused to shrink back when the naysayers came forward. Great leaders will attract, you will attract opposition. But we don't always have to respond. We can just get on with it. Think of Jesus. When he was questioned by Herod before his crucifixion, he remained silent. And likewise, we read this in verse 27 about Saul. But some troublemakers said, how can this fellow save us? They despised him and brought him no gifts. But Saul kept silent. I was once given a great piece of advice at work. Someone said to me before a meeting, Miles, better to remain silent and be thought of as an idiot than to open your mouth and remove all doubt. <laughs> you don't have to respond to all the criticism, but stand firm in your anointing. And remember that some people what they may criticize in you as, oh, they've changed, is actually just, you've grown with the Lord. Number five, great leaders develop intimacy with the Lord and worship on the mountaintop in their spiritual life. What do I mean? Well, in verse 13, we read this. After Saul stopped prophesying, he went to the high place. Now, the high places were places of worship. And the high place is found in your prayer life, uh, in your times of worship in God's presence, and in time spent in God's words, God's word. It's in these times that I know the Holy Spirit has sometimes given me great strategic ideas. But there's a balance here. You need the mountain top for inspiration and revelation, but then you actually need to come down from the mountain to put things into practice, to get stuff done. As leaders, we're to balance these mountain top moments with the day-to-day -day reality of life in the valley. And both are important. The sort of best example of this we find in the Old Testament is in Exodus chapter 17. Uh, you see, the Israelites are being blocked by the Amalekites who have come to fight them. And Joshua leads their army to fight the Amalekites in the valley. But Moses, the leader, goes up onto the mountaintop overlooking the valley. And he goes with his brother Aaron and with her. And whenever Moses raises his arms in prayer, Joshua begins to win the battle. But whenever he gets tired and he brings his arms down, they start to lose. So Aaron and Hur join him in praying and hold up his arms and Joshua and the Israelites win. What does this story tell us? Well, whatever battle you're facing, ultimately the battle is won on the mountaintop in prayer and worship. But that does not stop us from having to fight it out in the valley in the day-to-day -day bits of life. But don't ignore the mountaintop. Your yeah, leader's role is to bring heaven to earth, not to try and transport earth to heaven. And you can call down the power of heaven, the spirit, into any and every situation that you find yourself in day to day in the valley. Number six, great leaders are humble. Verse 16 says this, Saul replied, he assured us that the donkeys had been found, but he did not tell his uncle what Samuel had said about the kingship. I find this really interesting. 
Saul did not reveal to his uncle that Samuel had prophesied that he would become king. Some things are better kept to yourself. God will do what he said he will do in our lives. We don't have to broadcast it to everyone. And humility is key to great leadership. You will have seen uh, Dr. James on HTBB News talking about the first graduation ceremony that our college students have on the 31st of August. And one of the um, guests who have come to speak uh, is, the Arch is Archbishop Rowan Williams. He, for over 10 years, was the Archbishop of Canterbury, which is the leader of all the Anglicans around the globe, over 80 million people. That's quite a responsibility. And if you're Archbishop of Canterbury, you're given a residence in London called Lambeth Palace. And when he was Archbishop uh, living at the palace, um, his young son had a friend from school over to play with him. And as the boys were playing, uh, Rowan started to mop the kitchen floor. Later that evening, when the boy, the friend, went back home to his family, they turned on the TV, and it was the BBC News. And on the news, a journalist was interviewing Rowan Williams, the Archbishop of Canterbury. And the boy said to his mum, oh look mum, they're interviewing the cleaner from Lambeth Palace. <laughs> and the mum said, no, 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 no dear, that's the Archbishop of Canterbury. And the boy went, no, it's not, Mum. He, he cleans the palace. <laughs> of course, they were both right. Rowan is a wonderful, humble leader. But, you know, there's a difference between being humble and being insecure. In verse 21 of this chapter, just before Samuel uh, presents Saul to all the people as their king, they can't find him. They've lost Saul. Where is he? And eventually they find Saul hiding amongst all the bags because he's scared. That's insecurity, not humility. It's not a good thing. Verse 25, we read this. Samuel explained to the people the regulations of kingship and he wrote them down on a scroll. Isn't it interesting that kingship requires certain behavior and regulations, and so does leadership. You know, what, what you allow, you cannot change. Decide the right behavior that should be attached to your calling. It's the personal disciplines, the words you choose, the attitudes you display, the way you hold yourself, as well as the practical things. And as a leader, take responsibility to raise the standard of behavior for your family, your staff, those under your care, as well as your own behavior. Be the culture you want to see. And finally, number seven, great leaders are grounded. I love this in verse 26. It says this, Saul also went to his home in Gibeah. Do you know, after he's anointed king and presented to the people as their ruler, what's the first thing that Saul does? He doesn't go on a tour of the countryside saying, I'm now your king. He doesn't stand up and make grand speeches about his policies and plans. No, the first thing he does after being made king he goes home. There's wisdom in returning to and being committed to home. Home is where you're known and often the place of support. It's your proving ground. When another Saul in the New Testament, who then changes his name to Paul, St. Paul, when that Saul gets his dramatic conversion, what's the first thing they do? They send him back home because he, he had a lot of growing and learning to do, maturing, before he could begin his ministry. We underestimate the importance of committing ourselves to, to church as home and the impact that that has on our spiritual growth. 
And I know that Sarah and I hope that HTBB either is or will become your spiritual home, a place where you can grow, mature, a place where you can heal and step into your anointing and calling for all that God has for you. Great leaders are grounded. You know, recently I was watching some tennis and Roger Federer, who seems to defy the aging process, was playing a guy 21 years younger than him. And he was thrashing this young guy. And uh, the commentator on the TV was asked, how is it possible that Federer can still play like this? And the commentator said this, I wrote, I, so good, I wrote it down on my phone. He said, because Federer is so grounded off the court, he can bring his best on the court. And I think of Nicky Gumbel, who trained me back at HTB in Lansford and who pioneered Alpha. When it, the demand was growing, and it was going crazy all around the world, he was traveling around doing Alpha conferences in all these different nations. It would have been so easy to chase that and to have launched his, himself as Nicky Gumbel Ministries, Inc. But he didn't, he never did anything like that. He'd always return back on a Sunday to be back at his home church at HTB. He stayed grounded. And as a result, the blessing was even greater. So what is the takeout for us? Refuse to endlessly chase opportunity. Instead, stay planted where you are and build God's purposes in your life. And then watch as blessing and opportunity begin to follow you. Amen. Would you like to stand, please? We're going to pray. We're going to pray that ancient prayer. Come, Holy Spirit. For fresh anointing. Verse 6. The Spirit of the Lord will come upon you in power, and you will be changed. So let's either close our eyes, or you might want to put your hands out in front of you as if to say to yourself, I'm ready to receive, Lord. And then we just pray, come, Holy Spirit, would you pour out your power again upon us? Would you anoint us afresh for all the good things you have for us to do? Come, Holy Spirit, and receive.